Karen Wardley came to give us a talk at the Basingstoke Archaeological Historical Society meeting on the 14th of October. And we Zoomed uh, the call, uh, Zoomed the, the meeting for uh, those, those members who didn't really want to come to Church Cottage um, for one reason or another. So unfortunately, although they could see this, the picture, they couldn't see the sound. So in order to uh, make up for that, Karen has sent me her script and I'm going to uh, read it to you together with the, with the presentation. Now, Karen was very pleased to be able to get to Church Cottage. Uh, she'd had, certainly, uh, she was the next speaker on our program before the COVID lockdown um, occurred. And she wanted, really wanted to talk to us and enthuse us about the Hampshire medieval graffiti project. Of course, some of you are familiar with the project and, and may have taken, taken part, but for those who, who aren't, we're going to go through some background to it and, and run through what they do and why. We'll talk about examples of what they're finding and show how the discoveries can throw light on aspects of medieval and later life, as well as throwing up more questions which can lead to further research and study. The Hampshire project started in 2016 inspired by groundbreaking work being carried out in Norfolk. Until then, there hadn't been much interest in historical graffiti in this country. There was very little published. And in fact, the term graffiti was used to refer to something which was considered destructive, antisocial, and disfiguring. However, interest in the subject has grown rapidly and there are more county surveys being set up. And as they're set up, it's become clear that our ancient buildings are covered with these marks and that they re represent a valuable resource of previously unstudied material, which can greatly add to our knowledge and understanding of the past. Graffiti seems to be, have been an acceptable way of expressing ideas and beliefs in the past or of commenting on contemporary events. It was usually made by the ordinary common people whose voices are harder to find or missing altogether in the contemporary record. Their stories can add hugely to the interpretation of buildings and national bodies like Eng English Heritage have woken up to the significance of graffiti and are making a feature of it. For example, telling the story about, about the conscientious objectors held in, in the cells at Richmond Castle, Yorkshire, during the First World War. If you Google Nas National Trust and graffiti now, instead of finding stories about damage and vandalism, there are loads of examples of the fascinating new insights graffiti surveys have provided to many of their, of their sites, including graffiti apparently made by the young Isaac Newton um, at his home in Wal Walston Manor in Lynx. The British Museum's recent exhibition on the em Emperor Nero draws on contemporary graffiti to show his popularity with Roman citizens. This character, caricature was uh, drawn, on a <coughs> drawn on a shop wall on the Palatine Hill in Rome, and a poem scratched into the wall plaster in a house in Pompeii recalls his generous donation to the Temple of Venus there. So graffiti finally seems to have made it into the mainstream of historical and archeological research and interpretation. The Hampshire survey is one of many county surveys taking place, all carried out by volunteers. Ours is run under the auspices of the Hampshire Field Club and Archaeological Society. The project has spawned some local graffiti teams such as our keen groups in Southampton and Winchester. The surveys all follow the model of the pioneering work of the Norfolk Medieval Graffiti Study led by Matt Champion, which was set up with HLF support a few years ago. 
The surveys aim to locate, record and photograph historic graffiti in a systematic way to produce a whole new body of data which can be made accessible for study and research. And although we started off as a medieval church survey, we soon realized that we needed to broaden our remit as graffiti is found on all types of historic buildings, not just churches and not only on walls. Graffiti is ha often hard to date with accuracy and later graffiti is also important. And there are other interesting marks on buildings to record as well as graffiti. For instance, construction marks. We go about our surveys by arranging visits to churches and other sites. We often make a preliminary scoping visit first, trying to ensure that we'll be given access to all the areas. We carry out basic desktop research on the buildings and sometimes invite local history groups to become involved. Our volunteers carefully scan the building using raking light from handheld lamps. This has a magical effect, throwing these faint graffiti marks into relief so that they suddenly become visible. We then photograph the graffiti, making sure each image has a scale and record its type and location on simple recording sheets. Whilst most graffiti is easy to reach, this isn't always the case and some flexibility is needed. We've carried out over 60 surveys so far on a huge range of buildings and have made interesting discoveries in them all. However, our work doesn't stop when we carried out a survey. We then have to analyze and make sense of the data we've collected, which often involves consulting other researchers or specialists in different fields. Then reports are written for all interested parties, including the, HAMP, uh, the HER, Summaries are posted on the Hampshire Field Club website, and I often end up writing articles for parish magazines and the Hampshire Field Club newsletter. We really want to raise awareness of graffiti as it can be so easily overlooked or damaged, for example, when building repairs and alterations are carried out. For today's talk, while I'd love to tell you about all 60 of these sites, I'm going to focus on a few sites where we've been able to assess our findings in some detail and have made some new discoveries. I'll also try to show how the findings from these sites fit into the broader picture we're seeing all over the country and indeed nationally. These sites range from a shared research project at the Church of St Cross in Winchester to recent work in Southampton and a possible solution to a long-standing mystery at the medieval rural church at St Mary's Ashley. I'm going to start some, with somewhere that I'm sure you all know, the Hospital of St Cross and Almshouse of Noble Poverty, which is its full title, and it's just outside Winchester. It was founded by Henry of Blois, and then, then Bishop of Winchester between 1132 and 1136 to support 13 poor men so frail that they were unable to work and to feed 100 men at the gates each day. The 13 men became the brothers of St Cross. In the 15th century, Cardinal Beaufort expanded the existing hospital buildings and added the almshouse giving St Cross the look that it has today. There are now places for 25 brothers who despite their name aren't monks as the hospital is a secular foundation. Our Winchester based survey team spent three years recording the site where we were very privileged to be allowed all over the church and into other hospital buildings, including some of the brothers apartments. While working there, we promoted our work by giving talks to the staff, trustees and brothers, having a stall at the Michaelmas Fair and producing a graffiti trail which visitors can purchase at the Porter's Lodge. We also won over John Crook, who's a site archaeologist and author of the main guide to St Cross, to the importance of even the most insignificant historical graffiti 
so that when any building works take place, for example, when the old stable block was renovated to house new offices and visitor toilets, graffiti is always looked for and preserved. Our surveys there produced over 8,000 images from, a from over 138 separate visits. In a way, lockdown came at a fortuitous time as it's given us the time and opportunity to start to analyze all this data and has helped us to produce many spreadsheets. Coincidentally, last year, I was contacted by Martin Gale, a Winchester-based researcher who's been looking at the history of musical provision in early Winchester. And the, uh, and the professional networks of musicians which underpin this. He'd heard about our work and was interested in a Renaissance prayer desk on the northern side of the choir at St. Cross, which is inscribed with the names of numerous 16th century clerics and professional singers. We had to wait over a year before we could meet him in person to show him the desk. As before, he'd only seen photographs of it taken by us and by professional, professional photographer, Joe Lowe. Michael was bowed over by the wealth of inscriptions and now by combining his archival research with the prayer desk markings, he can tell us much more about choral provision and the organization of music in post-Reformation uh, Winchester. His research is ongoing, but the names and dates on the prayer desk have already helped him flesh out more details about certain individuals he'd been studying. One of these is Walter Cheney, whose name appears just below the name of John Watson, master of this place, who was master of St. Cross in 1559. Walter's name appears twice on the desk, once in this formally carved list um, of names, which must have been specially commissioned, and again in a more rough and ready uh, graffiti inscription next to Richard Fuller's. Michael had already established that Walter was born in the 1530s and was living in the Stoke area in Winchester in the 1580s, while singing at the cathedral from 1583 until his death in 1601. Walter's will and probate, probate inventory show that he was a man of modest wealth, owing owning two keyboard instruments, a pair of virginals valued at six shillings and eight pence, and a clapier cord worth 20, 20 pence. His first appearance at the cathedral was as, as a janitor in 1580, which is a, around the same time that John Watson, then Master of St. Cross, became Bishop of Winchester. So with the evidence from the prayer desk, our guess is that Cheney, had already been singing and hanging around at St. Cross for years. And when Watson was elected bishop, he was able to find, the, find him the janitor post at the cathedral as a foot in the door until he could be elected to the next available lay vicar. In other words, a singing person. Interestingly, another St. Cross man named on the desk, Morgan Linford, was also appointed in the same year. Besides appearing on the prayer desk, the name Walter Cheney is inscribed on the rib vaulting of the beer cellar beneath the Brethren's Hall. We can't prove that this is the same Walter, but it's quite an unusual name, and Michael has only found reference to one. What he was doing in the beer cellar is open to question, but perhaps he was helping out John Terry, brewer, whose name is also inscribed there. Singing men often had other occupation to help subsidize their income. It's tempting to speculate that he might have chosen this spot because in 1624, a cleric, John Earl, char caricatured a cathedral singer saying, the common singing men in cathedral churches are a bad society. And yet a company of good fellows that roar deep in the choir, the deeper still in the tavern. Their pastime or recreation is prayers, their exercise drinking. 
yet herein so re religiously addicted that they they secure God off this when they are drunk. Another name on the desk occurring twice is of Richard Gainett's sing singing man in 1583. Unlike Walter and most of the other singing men from St. Cross, he didn't move on to Winchester Cathedral. Instead, after spending his early career at St. Cross, he moved back to Salisbury where he'd been born and became lay vicar in the cathedral there in 1585. Then he was ordained becoming vicar choral in 1595. He died in 1624. Richard Fuller, whose initials and name appear next to Walters, is recorded at both Winchester and Salisbury cathedrals. The number of named singers listed on the St. Cross desk shows that there must have been a substantial choral presence at St. Cross, which was very unusual for those post-Reformation times. Elsewhere, church authorities had a much more austere attitude to church music. John Watson's predecessor as Bishop of Winchester, John Horne, cut down on the provision of music in the cathedral and banned the use of the organ at Winchester College. An interest in music at St. Joth, uh, St. Cross is also suggested by graffiti found in several places around the site. There are groups of lines which look like music staves, some appearing to have notes on them. Some were in the church, others in the brothers' apartments. We found similar graffiti in other Hampshire churches, for example at Southwark, but it's quite rare. We send details of any examples we find to the digital, digital image archive of medieval music set up by the University of Oxford Faculty of Music. The medieval stonework in the brothers' apartments is a rich source of graffiti, including names and dates, e.g. MH and AG in 1789, and this caricature, was it the master or another brother? Returning briefly to the prayer desk, amongst all the names and initials are some intriguing tiny graffiti showing a horse-drawn carriage and what appears to be a man with a pistol. The man's costume looks 17th century and looks like a highwayman holding up the carriage. I contacted two carriage collections at Arlington Court in Devon and the Carriage Foundation in Coventry to see if they could tell me more about the carriage. As it's so stylized, it's hard to date accurately, and it's probably 17th or 18th century. It's an enclosed carriage drawn by four horses and would have belonged to someone very wealthy. Here's a similar but later example from the Henry Ford Museum in the US. They also liked the idea of it being a highwayman and one curator sent this image of the highwayman, Captain Hine, James Hine, robbing Colonel Harrison near Maidenhead. Hine was causing trouble during the first half of the 17th century. Perhaps the person who carved this graffiti knew about a similar event. Our surveys at St. Cross also took us in, into the upper levels of the church, to areas usually only visited by those maintaining and repairing the building. Here we found many examples of graffiti left by workmen, mostly dating to the late 19th and 20th centuries, but with more modern examples too, showing that this is an ongoing tradition. The graffiti includes names and dates, descriptions of work carried out, and as well as caricatures, sketches, and even some rather risque uh, poetry. We found over 70 dated names, including some which occurred several times. One of these was the surname Newnan. Although we were unable to access local archives during lockdown, Catherine Secker, the St. Cross Porter kindly gave me a copy of Fred Newman's Memories of St. Cross, written in 1998. Fred was born and brought up in St. Cross, 
was a choir boy in the church and worked on the site for 50 years as a member of his family's building firm before becoming a brother in 1976. His memoirs include details of detailed accounts of some of the jobs he carried out there, including helping to remove the controversial mock medieval painted decoration put in by the 19th century architect, William Butterfield. Apparently, an extremely strong solvent, strong solvent had to be used, which necessitated rubber gloves and frequent replacement of brushes. We came across many instances of work recorded by different members of the Newman family, including Fred, who helped dispense distemper the lower belfry arches in October 1923 with E and Jane Newman, presumably his brothers. Here we find a reference to cleaning off the paint, but this was made by another, uh, by another contemporary workman, Walter Lashley, whose name also appears frequently, once as a glazier and often with other members of the Newnham firm. There are two wooden carts which belong to Newman's family building firm in the collections held by the Hampshire Cultural Trust at Milestones, which provide another tangible link to Fred's story. Another area of interest for us at St Cross was the huge number of Mason's marks we found there. Although not graffiti as such, we all always record these marks when we find them, as they tell, can tell us a lot about how the construction of buildings was organised. Most of the marks we found were banker marks. It's generally believed that Mason's were paid by piecework, which accounts for the use of these uh, banker Mason's marks. Masons mark their stone to let the paymaster know how much work they've done. Two documents are usually cited which make this clear, one for a building that has marks visible and one that doesn't. Lincoln Cathedral contracted with a mason to build the upper part of the crossing tower in 1306 and specified that the plain work, that is the warding stone, was to be costed by measure and the more complex work by the day. The stone blocks of the tower are covered in mason's marks. Exeter Cathedral, by contrast, paid its masons by the day during the Great uh, during the Great Restoration uh, of 12, 1280 to 1350, and there are no marks to be seen on the masonry erected during that period. There is no direct documentary evidence for the way that medieval marks were allocated, so we can only speculate. Masons may have chosen their own, own mark or have been given one when they joined the site. It's obviously important that marks weren't, e weren't easy to confuse, but it's clear that Masons didn't spend a long time cutting elaborate marks. Most marks are simple shapes consisting of between four to six lines, although we do find more elaborate marks at St Cross. Looking at the locations of the marks we've recorded, we found that they bore out the work done by John Crook, who'd used architectural, archaeological and documentary evidence to identify the different building phases on the site. We found that the range of Mason's marks at the east end and lower levels of the church, which is where the building work started in the early 12th century, gradually changed as work moved westward, westwards and then to the upper levels of the building. The Beaufort Tower, built later in the 15th century, contained distinctive marks which didn't occur at all in the church. Whether it's possible to date other contemporary buildings in the area by comparing these marks remains to be seen. We also wondered if the grouping of marks in particular areas would give us an idea about the number of masons working on site, if each mason had his own mark. We looked at the four piers in the crossing area between the nave and the choir. These had high con concentrations of different marks, with NC4 having 43 different marks and SC4 39. There was a correlation of 31 types, 
So this could give us an idea of how many masons were working on the site, and perhaps at least 31 worked on both of these columns. We also found assembly marks, which were used to aid construction. These enabled complex sections of things like doorways to be, be built up in the correct order. We found several examples, including these around doorways in the upper levels of the church. At this point, I'll move on to some other new findings that we've made, this time in Southampton, in the medieval vaults there. The work was interrupted by COVID, but has just restarted. The Southampton graffiti team has been working its way around the stone vaults in the old town area. These were originally used by the merchants who lived in timber frame houses above them to store, display and sell their merchandise. Many of these stone vaults survive and later served many other functions, including as air raid shelters in the 1940s. They're built from Isle of Wight limestone, which was the nearest source of building stone at that time. They've all been recorded archaeologically, but often graffiti and other marks have been overlooked or ignored, so we wanted to add to the record. When surveying the two vaults at 46 and 48 French Street in 2020, we noticed that many of the stone blocks were marked with what looked like uh, Roman numerals, and that blocks with similar marks were grouped together. We measured the blocks that had the numeral, numerals on them and found that the numerals den denote the size of the block. We think this indicates that the blocks were marked up before being delivered on, onto site to make the job of construction easier. I've been in touch with Dr. Jenny Alexandra at the University of Warwick who's a leading authority on Mason's marks about our findings. And she agrees that we make a good case for this. Interestingly, there don't seem to be any other recorded examples of this practice. So we may have a first for Southampton. There are similar markings on other, in other Southampton vaults. And the other weekend, we visited the medieval merchant's house, an English heritage property, almost next door to um, the other sellers to see if there were any marks in the vault there. We were pleased to find that there were, and again, blocks of the same markings were the same size. So our theory seems to be holding up. The next site I'll talk about is the charming little medieval church at St Mary's at Ashley, which is midway between Stockbridge and Winchester. It's managed by the Church, Church's Conservation Trust, formerly the Redundant Churches Trust. We've carried out many, many surveys in, in most of the Hampshire CCT churches now. They've been very supportive of and, and interested in our work. Their churches were some of the first to reopen last, week, uh, last year, which enabled us to return to Ashley to complete a survey we'd started previously and to revisit some graffiti which has intrigued and puzzled us. The church is mainly Norman in date and has a narrow chancel arch with later openings each side. In the jam of the south window in the chancel is a 13th century wall painting of a young woman, possibly the Virgin Mary. There is quite a lot of graffiti there. Unsurprisingly, as a Christian building, there are many crosses most of which are incised around the entrance doorway. These crosses probably re represent acts of personal devotion made by parishioners entering the church. We do have a rare contemporary reference to such acts. For example, in the 12th century life of, uh, life of Christina of Markiegate, a religious mystic. It recalls that when she, uh, re calls that when she visited St Albans Abbey, she scratched the votive cross into the doorway with her fingernail as a physical symbol of a vow of devotion and chastity. Generally, we find that most graffiti in churches is around the entrance doorway, often on the first pillar that people encountered on entry. 
There is a good example of this at Sparshall Church and here at St. Amazing Soak at St. Michael's. We also find a lot in church porches and again at Ashley there is, there is an 18th century painted graffiti in the brick porch uh, which was built in 1701. We don't know who George Pole was or what was happening there here around about 1708. But porches were traditionally areas where local business deals were carried out. There are many documentary references to this. For instance, the Southampton Book of Instruments of 1576 records that John Griffiths had to repay a debt in the church porch at Farringdon on the four main feast days of the year between one and three o'clock. So some porch graffiti may relate to agreements struck by individuals who left their names and dates. At St Peter's Church in Ropley, where we carried out a survey prior to repair works following a devastating fire in 2014, we found many initials in the south porch, which were dated 17, 1711. The repetition of the date suggested that there had been a significant event in the community at the time. We then discovered that on the 20th of December 1710, the first ever private bill of enclosure was passed for the enclosure of Ropley Commons, an estimated 500 acres of land. This was a very important moment for those living in the parish. Tenants would have been allocated a share, a plot of land to enclose, plough and sow. So was the administration for this allocation carried out in the porch, witnessed and dated by those present with their marks and initials? We can't know for certain. It seems too much of a coincidence not to be connected with this. At Ashley, we also found some compass drawn shapes, somewhat, sometimes known as hex files or daisy worms. There was one set by the entrance and this very elaborate pattern with several single examples on the, on the chancel arch. Such symbols are common in churches but are also often found in, on domestic and agricultural buildings and believed to be upper traic or ritual protection marks, protecting the buildings and their contents from evil. They're usually around openings, windows, doors and chimneys where evil spirits might enter. There are some good examples in Tudor House, Southampton, King, King John's House, Romsey and St Cross. And the same motive is also used on 20th, 21st century uh, gadgets, which supposedly give protection against harmful electromagnetic rays. Finding these marks inside churches raises the question of why such protective marks might be needed in a, in a consecrated space, but they do provide some insight into the medieval mind. Fear of the devil and the proximity of evil was perceived to be a very, very real danger at that time. So this belt and braces approach to protect the parishioners would be understandable. It's also true though, also true that this hex file shape does appear in more formal early church carvings from the Norman period. For example, on these fine Norman fonts and seems to have been used as an alternative to the cross. After the Reformation, the use of the shape evolved and it, it made its way into secular buildings as a purely protective or lucky device, its religious connotations forgotten. On the north side of the chancel arch, we also found this group of graffiti, referred to in the guidebook as scratched geometric designs. We believe that they, herald, they are heraldic shields which may have been associated with prominent local families. It's usually hard to identify these with any certainty. As colour, the most distinguishing her heraldic feature is missing. Although there is a shield in size that East Meon uh, Church, which is pretty certainly that of the Clare family, local lord of the manor. Below the shields is a pentagon or five pointed star. Although associated today with black magic, this shape was a Christian symbol 
representing the five wounds of Christ. In the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, Gawain has a shield bearing a pentagram, symbolizing his purity and knightly virtues. On the north side of the chancel arch, at eye level, is a graffito Latin inscription. This writing on the wall is scratched in onto a layer or layers of whitewash. The Church Conservation Trust are aware of it, mentioning it in the guidebook, but its meaning appeared to be a mystery. No one at all seemed to know what it said. So my colleague, Karen Parker, who's transcribed many medieval wills and inventories, took it on as a challenge. Medieval Latin graffiti inscriptions are notoriously hard to decipher due to worn surfaces, the use of dog Latin with many abbreviations and a cavalier approach to spelling. We took many photographs of the inscription lit from different directions so that the faint lettering could all be seen. Some parts are readable, others less so, and some words are missing. Eventually, Karen could see that the inscription started with the holy monogram ICHC, Jesus. Below this was a date, Ultimo, Ultimo di Juni, the last day of June. And below this, Ivadi Sexti, 1550, in the reign of Edward VI, 1550. Karen wondered about the significance of this date and if it was connected with the Protestant reforms which were being carried out then, when the authorities were trying to stamp out the old Catholic practices, which many churches were reluctant to abandon. She discovered that an act was passed in 1550 for the defacing of images and bringing in of books of old service in the church and which also significantly ordered the destruction by the end of June of all images of stone, timber, alabaster or earth, graven, carved or painted, which heretofore have been broken out of any church or chapel or yet stand in any church or chapel. The responsibility for this destruction lay with local officials such as church wardens. There were hefty fines for failure to comply, 20 shillings for a first offence, and four pounds for a second, and imprisonment for a third. There was in consequence a widespread covering over of wall paintings with whitewash in English par parish churches at this time, including at Bramley Church near Basingstoke, where the parish records of 1550 include expenses incurred for the replacement of the altar with a simple table and the whiting of the church. How tempting it is then to suppose that this inscription was made by the parish priest or other church official in Ashley to formally recall that the requirements of the 1550 Act had been carried out just in the nick of time and that the building was free from all graven images and idolatrous wall paintings. That these paintings existed is evidenced by the image of the Virgin Mary which survived under lime wash and has now been restored but presumably there were, there were many more. As a possible example of what could have been destroyed, here are some of the splendid wall paintings at Bramley, which were whitewashed out of sight in 1550, but are visible again. I hope these examples show what a valuable historical resource graffiti can be and how satisfying it is when graffiti inscriptions, documentary evidence, museum objects can tie together so neatly to tell us more stories about people in the past. If you are interested in, in getting involved with the Hampshire Medieval Graffiti Project, um, the Basingstoke Archaeological and Historical Society is setting up a, a small team um, that would be uh, that you are free to join and it's being organized by, by Ginny Pringle. So if you'd like to get involved with uh, some surveys of some local churches to try and find out what, what type of graffiti they have, and maybe, uh, you know, this will lead us into further research to try and understand more about what was happening 
uh, in, in our buildings in the past. So if you're interested, then please get in contact with Ginny. Um, and I'm sure she'd be very pleased to hear from you. Thank you.